Okay, guys. Hey, welcome into the show. It is week two, already the second week. And if we want to kind of dumb it down a little bit and simplify it, we after this weekend, we are pretty much one-seventh of the way through the entire college fantasy football season from start to your league championship. After this week, the league will be one-seventh of a way over. So, um, I'm going to do much like I did last week. You know, I got a lot of emails about uh, the the um, the last week's show with kind of previewing every game on, on what I'm looking for, what everyone else should be looking for. What do we have our eyes on? Who are the players that really uh, we're kind of waiting to emerge? Where are the answers at in some of these position battles for teams? Um, waiting for a few things to play out. Sometimes it does take two or three weeks especially when you get those teams that maybe it's an FBS versus FCS opponent um, and they really don't get that competition in week one. You really see where things shake out as the competition gets a little stiff and, 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 and the depth charts become a little bit clearer. So that's what we're going to do. And then I did not do it last week. I think the slate is a little bit more straightforward this week. Uh, not as many games on there. So I am going to run down the start bench before we post it on the site tonight. Um, so I'm going to do that. But the one thing that I want to open up with first, and, and for everybody that, that's really tuning in, thanks, thanks you guys for, for coming in live, is really to address the, uh, the exclusive email real quick, the, the weekly projections, the weekly extended rankings. Uh, we've had some emails come in because what we did is we gave everyone a preview of the weekly projections last week. That was some of the premium content new for this year. We gave everybody a free look at that last week. We went ahead and protected it uh, this week. So the password is on there. Now, I've had a lot of questions come in. Uh, and I'll get to your O'Leary question there uh, a little bit later on. So thanks for that. A lot of questions coming in on, on Brandon O'Leary Orange for Nevada. Um, a lot of the emails that I had been sending out last year, even the year before, even in the preseason this year, for some reason, they just get lost in the shuffle. They get sent to junk mail folders. I get a lot of guys emailing me back. Hey, man, I missed your email. Um, I thought it would just be easy to simplify everything. I'm just going to put all the exclusive email material up on the site. You guys have the password uh, password to get in that. That way I'm letting you go to the exclusive email content. I'm letting you go to the extended uh, rankings every week instead of me sending them out to you. You telling me, some of you, that you never got it, and then I have to go ahead and resend it. Uh, just eliminates a lot of the administrative work um, down the line. And so that's the reason for posting everything on the site is to streamline everything into one location for you. And then we have the projections on top of that. Uh, so the projections is separate from the exclusive email and the extended rankings. And thanks to everyone, thanks to everyone that helped support all of our preseason content and have another good preseason year for us with that preseason uh, fantasy guide the preseason projection tool, now the weekly rankings, the extended rankings, and the exclusive email, the weekly observations and notes that I send out and post up on the site uh, every Sunday or Monday. There was It was really an extensive list. And so I'm sure you guys, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that as well. But, you know, we're going to jump right on into it, guys, because I'm going to go down the slate. We're going to look at every game like we did last year, uh, last week. And I don't have any notes. Everything's in my head. I feel like I'm ready to rock and roll week two. <clears throat> but we're going to open it up with the Friday night matchup. Obviously, there are no games tonight. NFL's kicking off. And if you're like me, thanks to you guys for joining in live. Um, I'll catch up on the NFL game after halftime in the second half and enjoy that. But let's get into what we're looking at for college fantasy football this week, week two. Here we go. Friday night matchup, TCU at SMU, and you have to be really pleased if you were an owner and supporter of Sean Robinson at the beginning of the year. I was telling some of you guys Sean Robinson could be a sneaky pick. Big game early on in the first week. I think he's going to have another big game Friday night here against SMU. Um, so I think you have to like Robinson moving forward, but there is concern on, concern on that SMU side with Ben Hicks. You know, you I would have thought he would have had a much better game against North Texas. Proche, uh, Reggie Roberson is the wideouts. I still see those guys as the top two guys, but I am concerned for that SMU offense. I am concerned if you have SMU players this week. I don't know what to expect 
after that performance against North, North Texas in week one. And this is why it's disappointing. It wasn't an FCS opponent. That was a game that SMU, that's gonna, that game's going to come into play at the end of the year. So SMU was going to have their horses come out of the gate strong. The fact that they didn't in that opening matchup uh, was really concerning for me. So um, let's look ahead now to the Saturday matchups, uh, New Mexico, Wisconsin. I think all eyes, obviously, on Jonathan Taylor for Wisconsin. If I'm going to go over to New Mexico and switch gears for a little bit, I think if you were able to scoop up Tyrone Owens in a draft this year, I think you've got to feel pretty pretty good about his prospects for the 2018 season, not necessarily this week, but moving on into, into the year. Mississippi State at Kansas State, really interesting matchup for me. We don't know what's going on with quarterback at Kansas State, but that's okay. The real, the real question is, what's going on at Mississippi State, right? What a perform... I mean... The shoes that Nick, the expectations that Nick Fitzgerald has this week at Kansas State, I wouldn't want to be Nick Fitzgerald. I mean, Thompson with an unbelievable performance last week, last week, and if you were able to score him and start him, gosh, I think he led the entire college fantasy football uh, player pool in points scored last week. But here's the thing: I, you know, obviously it's likely going to be Fitzgerald, um, Kylan Hill. What a surprise, right? A uh, lot of lot of momentum for him building up toward, as the summer progressed. Now as the season started, and it does look like, in my opinion, uh, that it's going to be Kylan Hill over Eris Williams. All the signs point to that. Um, rushing and receiving out of the backfield, he's just a great fit for that offense. And I do think he's a start this week on the road at Kansas State, but that is a sneaky game for the Bulldogs. Western Michigan at Michigan, okay, you know, weekend, weekend. I don't know if there's really much to evaluate for Michigan right now, except I would assume that they're going to be very similar to what they have been. Uh, I think if you've got Karan Higdon, I think you're okay. But I want to jump to Western Michigan because after that performance last week against Syracuse, they put up a lot of points. Dwayne Eskridge was a hot waiver wire name. Um, he was a hot ad, and I would imagine there's a lot of fantasy owners after that performance itching to get him in the lineup for week two. But I caution you, the Broncos traveling on the road to Michigan, if you were able to score Eskridge off the waiver wire, my opinion, I think you have to stash him for a week. I don't think this is a good start for him this week, even though some of you will be itching to uh, get him in your lineup. Uh, Townsend at Wake Forest. If you, I, I watched some Wake Forest and the Tulane game last week. Obviously, Greg Dorch back up to his old tricks. I like the way that they utilized Alec Bachman. Um, he was the isolated receiver on his side of the formation. I think he's going to see some returns this week as well. And, um, you know, Scotty Washington's still out. So you've got another receiver over there that's getting some more targets. And it'll be curious to see if Washington comes back if that eats into the third receiver's targets. Um, but I, I, I think for me, the takeaway on the Wake, Wake Forest game is what's going on at running back? You know, I, it looked like I thought it was going to be Matt Colburn. Now, all of a sudden, we've got a split with Kate Carney. Carney was in at the end. He was the one that got the touchdown in overtime. And I still I, I think you're looking at a true 50-50 split right now, unless maybe some got, somebody gets hurt early on or some guy just absolutely blows the doors off the building. But I think you're looking for a 50-50. I think you can expect a 50-50 split in that Wake Forest backfield. Eastern Michigan at Purdue. I think if, it, I, look, Rondell Moore, what a performance in week one. He obviously had that nationally televised game. Uh, a lot of attention brought to him. He was a, wa a hot waiver wire ad. And then I think you're looking at him and Sparks leading the offense in receptions this year for 2018. The question is, is who is going to be getting the ball to them? Is it going to be Blow, a blah? Is it going to be Sindelar? We just don't know after that performance by Sindelar. Um, but those are the two receivers that I would have in that offense going forward. Uh, Liberty at Army. Um, I think you have to feel good if you drafted Antonio Gandy Golden right out of the gate with the performance that he had. You have to, uh, yeah, that he had. You have to feel really encouraged by that week two matchup at Army. I think that's another good matchup for Liberty. So I think you get Gandy Golden in your um, in your lineups again for week two. Nevada at Vanderbilt. Now here's something I'm going to warn some some fantasy owners about this week is with the Nevada offense. First of all, a lot of emails coming in about Brendan O'Leary Orange. Um, I think I got alerted right before kickoff that he wasn't dressed out. I don't think I even saw that till after kickoff. Um, thankfully, I didn't have him in any of my leagues. 
I did like uh, McLean Mannix and, and Ty Ganji in that matchup, but this week Nevada goes to Vanderbilt. So if you have Brandon O'Leary Orange, you're holding on to him anyway. You probably wouldn't put him in your starting lineup. You can probably get by with Mannix this week in your starting lineup. I don't know if I would be starting Ty Ganji, the quarterback. Middle Tennessee played Vanderbilt last week with Brent Stockstill. That Vanderbilt defense held them to under 200 yards passing last week. I'd be a little hesitant to put any Nevada guys into my starting roster this week unless unless I really needed a receiver and Mannix would be that guy. Um, next on the list, we're going to go to Arizona, Houston, and, and you can't tell me if you have Khalil Tate that you're not kind of second-guessing yourself right now and really watching with eyes wide open this week when they travel to Houston to play the Cougars. Now, I think Khalil Tate's going to be okay, but big concern coming out of the gate in a home matchup against BYU. I mean, uh, Tate did not do anything on the ground, and I think, I think if you're a Khalil Tate owner right now, you're watching this weekend hoping and praying that he takes off because if it doesn't happen after two weeks, um, wow, wow, I, I don't even want to think about it, but I think you're going to be okay. I think the matchup's good. And with Houston on the Houston side, a little slow last week, took them the while to get, took them a while to get going. We still don't know what's going on in that backfield, but we do know Marquez Stevenson and Courtney Locke look like the top two targets for Derek King this, uh, this year. And I like Stevenson a lot. He was doing work out the backfield and as a receiver. He may end up being better than Courtney Lark, who I projected to be the Cougars' top wideout this year. So let's keep an eye on how that develops. If you were able to get Stevenson off the waiver wire, good for you. I think you get him in this week. Duke at Northwestern. Uh, I think out of this matchup, I, you look at Jeremy Larkin and you look at last week's game against Purdue and you say, yes, he's what I thought he was going to be. He was even taking snaps, uh, making reads out of the Wildcat down there in the red zone Give me Larkin in the Wildcat, and that increases his chances of getting in the end zone. I think if you've got Larkin moving forward, you have to feel really encouraged by his chance, by his prospects moving forward into this season. Georgia Tech in South Florida. You know, I made a recommendation to bench Cervante Benson, the running back last week, uh, to be back for Georgia Tech because he was suspended for one quarter. Bad call on my part, guys. I missed that. He scored two touchdowns uh, um, when he came back. Um, I just wasn't looking forward to playing a guy against Alcorn State that was going to miss the first quarter. And over at South Florida, I think from there, the take uh, for me is uh, Cronkite didn't play last week. So interesting to see how that kind of, how he fits in this week in that running back situation. But I think it's St. Felix is the guy, uh, wide receiver with McCants, um, you're looking at as the, the top wideouts for the Bulls this year. At least that's what it looks like after one week. Georgia State at North Carolina State coming up this week. Um, I was expecting bigger things for Penny Hart last week. I have to tell you, if you drafted Penny Hart, um, I kind of I, I think you're maybe hoping for a big game maybe this week, but I'm not sure how he's going to be long term. I see him more as a depth filler on your roster. Um, as opposed to an every week play. And for North Carolina State, I think if you have Jacoby Myers, which I have him in a league, um, as opposed to Kelvin Harmon, you have to feel really good to, with the targets that he that he received. And I was on board with Harmon coming into the season as maybe being the top receiver for the Wolfpack. It looks like it could be Jacoby Myers, but here's the one thing in that matchup or, or for, for the Wolfpack. It does seem like Reggie Gillespie does have a stranglehold on that number one running back spot, at least early on, over the uh, freshman Ricky Person. So if you have Gillespie, I think you have to feel encouraged, um, and and he has to be a start this week if you look up the mat if you look at that matchup against Georgia State, UCLA at Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Here it is. You know, Kyla Murray. Um, you've got Rodney Anderson. You've got Marquise Brown. Um, I'm curious to see where C.D. Lamb fits in. I was expecting better numbers last week. Let's be honest, Oklahoma didn't really need that. Rodney Anderson, I think, had 100 yards on five carries last week. So, you know, if you're an owner of Rodney Anderson, you have to feel very fortunate that you were able to get as many points from Rodney Anderson on as few of touches that he received last week. But 
Looking more from that, uh, looking to see where that Oklahoma offense, how they kind of uh, land in the in the fantasy world this week. Uh, I even expect bigger things from Kyler Murray. I thought he would have a bigger week one, but when you look at UCLA and you look at their home matchup against Cincinnati last week, I have to tell you, um, I don't know what we're going to get out of UCLA this year. Um, it looks to me maybe they're on a two-year plan before they get going. Um, you know, Bolu, the running back, uh, was not was not it. Joshua Kelly was obviously first on the depth chart. Um, he wasn't it. I think it was Kazmir Allen, who is the freshman, that had the big run. But other than that one play, guys, uh, UCLA really did not look good at all. And I'm curious to see if they develop as the year goes on. So I think if you have Bolu, you have to hold on to him at least for another week. You can't knee-jerk. And just get rid of him. I think you have to hold on to him for at least one more week. I think if you did pick up Joshua Kelly, you can probably get rid of him. Um, but let's track now Bolu and Allen and see where this offense goes over the next few weeks. Um, you still got still have the tight end as well, um, Caleb uh, Caleb Wilson, and we'll see where Theo Howard fits in too as UCLA progresses under Chip Kelly. So I think that's going to be a watch offense. And one of the offenses that we'll see develop as the season progresses, but maybe right now you don't have anyone except possibly Bolu um, on your roster right now. Boston College at Holy Cross, and I have to tell you, I watched, you know, last week's game, it was very painful to watch Davin Jones have two one-yard plunges for Boston College when I had A.J. Dillon at the top of my running back rankings last week. Really should have had three touchdowns if he stays in the game. I, I can't tell you guys. I, was, I wanted to throw my remote through the wall um, when A.J. Dillon did not get those one-yard plunges. William & Mary at Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech with a very impressive win against Florida State Monday night on Labor Day. Right now, for me, the only sure bet for Virginia Tech this week is starting their defense. Um, I'm curious still to see how they use Hazleton. Um, I think as the competition you know, lessens, the defenses aren't as good as Florida State. I think he'll get utilized more. I think if you're going to make a play this week in any for any of the Virginia Tech guys, maybe it's McLeese, maybe it's Peoples, the running back. I don't know. Maybe Jackson, the quarterback. But, you know, with a matchup against William & Mary, I'm, I, I'm just... I don't know after coming off of a big win against Florida State if we're really going to see one guy just explode this week for a statistical outbreak. Um, and if you so, if you've got a Virginia Tech play on your roster this week, other than the defense, um, you might want to just pump the brakes a little bit and and let's see where we're at moving forward after week two. Portland State at Oregon, and if you are uh, an owner of Justin Herbert, you have to feel extremely good. Tony Brooks James. Uh, didn't get as many carries as C.J. Verdell, um, and, and that was something that didn't surprise me. But that Oregon offense, and don't get me wrong, it was a route, guys. They didn't really need a lot of their top guns um, against Bowling Green. They have Portland State this week. I think you're going to see a similar performance from Oregon that we saw last week. So I don't know what to expect out of Tony Brooks James. I don't know what to expect out of C.J. Verdell. And right now, I would think that Oregon's going to be riding the hot hand of Justin Herbert. And if you had him, he's probably in your lineup with wide receiver Dylan Mitchell. He's probably in there as well. Um, but I don't know whether Oregon running back situation, where that lands right now. So we do need to monitor that again going into week two. Air Force at FAU. Um, I think this is Arian Worthman, and this is a Devin Singletary game. I mentioned Durant, uh, J Javon Durant, Durant, uh, the former wide receiver from West Virginia. I do think he's the, the wide receiver to have for FAU. Um, but really, as far as this matchup goes to me, those are the two guys that we're really watching this week. Kansas at Central Michigan. I sent this out in my exclusive email. Um, Kansas won three games in the last three years combined. I thought based on their preseason schedule, they had a chance to equal that output this year by winning their three non-conference games. Well, they lost two FCS opponents, Nichols, uh, FCS opponent Nickel State in week one. I have to tell you, it doesn't look promising for week two at Central Michigan, who really does need a rebound game after that road loss to Kentucky. We didn't get much from Jonathan Ward. I would expect to see him play much better in week two. But I think if you own Steve Sims right now, you're really hoping for another touchdown, maybe another 70, 80 yards. Maybe he performs well in his first two games. 
you pair him up in some type of a trade heading into the season, uh, heading into conference play. I'm telling you guys, it's just that, that Kansas team is just in bad shape right now. And I don't know if I would be touching anyone. I'm, I, if I, as an owner of Steve Sims, I'd be hoping for a couple of good games and package him up, leverage him in a deal, in a trade uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. We've got Arkansas State at Alabama, and look, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna spread the ball throughout that backfield. They've got four running backs, guys, that can carry the ball. So I don't know if we're gonna get Damian Harris for 150 yards. I don't know if we're gonna get Najee Harris for 150 yards. It looks like we may get them all just line up and and score a rushing touchdown each. I do think Jerry Judy is definitely the wide receiver to have in that offense. But over on the Arkansas State side. I think it was Justin Hansen threw five touchdowns last week. Um, you know, I, you know look, a little four, I'm not going to hide anything here. Justin Hansen is on my bench list this week um, playing at Alabama. I don't know how you start anybody playing at Alabama, uh, especially with a Sun Belt school. But I do have a sneaky, I just have this really strange feeling that Arkansas State's going to score more points against Alabama's defense than Louisville did. On a neutral site, it's and I love Louisville and I love offense, love their offense and I love their quarterback moving forward. I just got a sneaky feeling about this Arkansas State offense, but I'm not chancing it. I'm not putting um, Justin Hanson in my starting lineup this week. Georgia at South Carolina, real interesting matchup. More eyes will be on this matchup just from a competitive standpoint and an SEC East standings than we're looking at it from a college fantasy football perspective. Because when I look at this matchup. I actually said last week that Bentley's a little bit under a radar quarterback play. You've got Brian Edwards. You've got Debo Samuel. Um, South and, and a good defense for South Carolina. They have the pieces in place on paper to look like they're going to give Georgia everything that they can handle. And I have to tell you, for me, when I look at Georgia, you know, Nick Chubb's gone, Sonny Michelle's gone. Um, I, I just, I think it comes down to the running game. In defense, I think Georgia goes on the road, and I think they win this game. And I'm really curious to see if DeAndre Swift takes his game to another level. Um, but that's what we're looking for in week one. I, I think if you're in a Power 5 league and you've got Edwards and you've got Samuel, you may have to take a chance and stick them in there. I, I think those guys can make a play. I think they can score against that Georgia defense. But I think in the end, it's going to be the Georgia running game and, and the Georgia defense and DeAndre Swift to pull that game out on the road. Um, let's see. We've got Rutgers at Ohio State. What a performance by Ohio State last week. And I have to tell you, if you have J.K. Dobbins, you're looking at Mike Weber thinking thinking to yourself, uh-oh, you're doing the same thing that Mike Weber owners did last year when J.K. Dobbins went off in the first game and you said, uh-oh. I do think now that Weber is healthy, which he wasn't going into last year, and that's why Dobbins got the carries in those opening games Weber was not healthy in the first part of last year, and Dobbins exploded on the scene. If Weber is fully healthy now, um, maybe all of those predictions of J.K. Dobbins being so good top five back in the nation, maybe all of that takes a back seat. And maybe some of you guys got an absolute steal in Mike Weber for Ohio State this year. Dwayne Haskins, nice game, by the way. It looks like he's going to be a solid performer for you this year in fantasy, too. Ball State playing at Notre Dame this week. I think if you have Brandon Wimbush, you have to feel encouraged after that performance against a good defense. Yes, it was at home, but it it, it looked like a, um, uh, a confident Wimbush. And I think the story coming out of this game in fantasy circles leading up to the season, even in some of the emails that I had sent out leading up to the season, uh, the momentum... Uh, picking up for Jafar Armstrong, I think if you have him, you have to feel really good about him moving forward. He didn't have many yards. He did find the end zone twice. They have Ball State coming up this week. I think he finds a way to get more yards for you guys. So I think you have to feel encouraged if you have Jafar Armstrong. And I think you get him in your lineup this week. Even if you're in a Power 5 or full FBS league, um, that's a great matchup against Ball State. We have uh, Nebraska at home against Colorado. Nebraska game that got canceled last week. We have Colorado. And I mentioned in, in my exclusive email last week that La, La Visca Chenault is, is one of the reasons why you don't pay attention to depth charts going into week one. Because 
I don't think he was listed as a starter on the depth chart, but yet leading up to the season, he was all that I heard about in spring tra- in spring camp. He was all that I was hearing about in preseason camp, and then he doesn't get listed on the depth chart as a starter, but yet he goes out, and I think he caught like 11 passes, led the team in receiving, and he was the standout in game one. So um, I think he's the guy to have moving forward. He it looks like the playmaker in their offense right now. So I'm definitely looking at Chenault to have another good game against Nebraska, who, let's face it, they never played. We never got to see them play. They're going to be ha- amped up on adrenaline in Scott Frost's first game. But it's not like they are going to be world beaters in their first year, and the Colorado offense is going to score some points. So I, I think you have to put Chenault in your lineup. And I'm really curious to see where the freshman quarterback Martinez for Nebraska kind of how he performs in his first game and whether or not he is going to be a weekly option or a spot start option moving forward into 2018. Buffalo at Temple. Um, I'm going to say this again. I said it last year. Temple, uh, Rockwell Armstead. Um, I'm just not, I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. I'm ready to move on for him if you from him if you drafted him. And on the Buffalo side, I think you can expect a tight end matchup this week. I don't think Tyree Jackson's going to go off, but I do think um, if you know, given the matchup, you've got to put Anthony Johnson in your starting lineup. He's one of the top receivers in the country, and he has to be in and a starter on the road at Temple. Memphis playing at Navy in a game that I expect to have a lot of points, and I think for me. Looking at Navy, the one thing that I have, and I have Malcolm Perry in one of my leagues, is Zach Aby, four touchdowns. I mean, and I look at that and I say, okay, if he's going to rush for 15, I think it was like maybe five carries, 14 yards, four touchdowns. It was something similar to that. Malcolm Perry's fantasy stock takes a huge hit if that's going to be the case. I still think he's going to have his long runs. He's still going to get his 100-yard games, but man... If you're going to steal two touchdowns from Malcolm Perry every game on the ground, that's the difference from being a tier one quarterback, fantasy quarterback at the end of the year, and just being a quarterback two, given the matchups throughout the season. So, um, you know, I, that that really will be curious to see moving forward, but I don't know how things change. Um, I think AB's going to stay the short yardage guy, and, um, you know, it, unfortunately for Malcolm Perry owners, they're probably going to have to live with Zach A.B. having more rushing touchdowns than Malcolm Perry this year. So we'll see. And I don't know, maybe the play is going to be where Malcolm Perry busts three long touchdown runs and all of a sudden nobody realizes that Zach A.B. didn't get a chance to rush inside the five and they see Malcolm Perry as three touchdowns, 250 yards rushing. And maybe at that point you package Malcolm Perry uh, while his stock is high. So remember I threw that out there, guys. I'm just kind of giving you some of the strategies on what to do with some of these players uh, as we get down the line with trades, especially if AB's going to vulture the one, two, three, four, five yard touchdowns from Malcolm Perry. Um, East Carolina playing at home against North Carolina. Um, you know, two teams that really need to get back on track. And North Carolina... You know, any decent quarterback play against against Cal, Cal, and they probably win that game. Nathan Elliott threw four interceptions. Uh, I think he was like 15 of 36 passing. If you have Anthony Ratliff, Ratliff Williams, you had to feel really good that you got 60 yards and a touchdown out of him given Elliott's performance. I think Elliott will be better in another start this week if he starts. Um, and I think you get Ratliff Williams back in your lineup right now. For East Carolina... Uh, tr- yeah, I had three receivers, I believe, that caught at least nine passes or eight passes. They just didn't really connect for anything downfield. I think Herring threw 50-something passes, completed 30-something, and I don't even know if he topped 300 yards passing. So East Carolina really needs some downfield passing. Everything was right underneath. They had three guys, and if, you, if you're in PPR, Trevon Brown was still okay for you. But I was expecting more out of that offense, expecting more out of Trevon Brown. I'm not panicking yet. I still feel okay. But it's really over the next two weeks um, going to gonna show me where that Trevon Brown pick lands. And I think East Carroll offense, much like UCLA, could take a couple of weeks to get going with that passing game. So we'll see how that plays out. Wagner playing at Syracuse, and I know a lot of you guys were waiting for me to get to Syracuse to talk about what's going on with that wide receiver situation, quarterback situation. And, and Dungey didn't look great. I mean, look, you look at Dungey's numbers, 200 yards rushing, 
And it's like, wow, man, I've got a stud this year. For a minute, it looked like Dungy wasn't even coming back into the game, and you were thinking to yourself, wow, here we go again. Dungy's hurt. Remember, Dungy has not finished a full se- he, he has not played a full season in his three, first three seasons at Syracuse. Okay, so it's, it's difficult to think that he's going to, th- you know, I, it, I don't want to just assume he's going to be healthy all year. But the one thing under Dino Babers um, in, in that system is that, and I mentioned this, I emailed this to someone that was asking me about Butler and, and Custis, is the guy that has started fast in that offense over the last two years has usually been the guy that has been their number one receiver. Well, there's no debating who was the guy that started fast in week one. It was Custis. And you could say the wide receiver play wasn't great. I mean, the inside receiver, Sean Riley and Devin Butler, both combined for zero catches. Zero catches. I mean, that that was just absolutely wild for me to see Syracuse, you know, operate like that. But I have no problem right now saying that Custis is going to be the number one receiver. I would assume he has to be. I think Butler's not going to get blanked again. Um, But I, right now, if I was making plans, I would be ecstatic if I had Jamal Custis right now. And that's my thought on the Syracuse offense. It's it, it would be difficult for me to all of a sudden think that there are, that that Devin Butler is going to you know reverse the trend and catch seven passes for 180 yards every game moving forward and he's going to be the number one guy. I think the number one guy is going to be Custis. We'll see. He's had some injury concerns in the past as well, so he has to stay healthy. So I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens. But Syracuse did punch a number of them in on the ground. Eventually, those are going to go in through the air, and we'll see where they go. Kent State playing home against Howard, and I have to tell you, if you're looking for a sleeper in a deep FBS league, Woody Barrett is your guy. Um, yeah, no, great point. Butler dropped 25 passes that game. I, I get it, but that here to my point, um, is he really going to be the number one guy if he can't secure the ball? So you know that just kind of plays into Custis argument even more. So anyway, going back to Akron, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Kent State at home against Howard. If you're looking for a deep sleeper in FBS this year, or in DFS uh, this week. Woody Barrett, quarterback Kent State, is your guy, dual threat. And while I'm on that same uh, same uh, sleeper level, you look one day, one game down farther in the slate, Morgan State playing at Akron. Akron did not play in their Week 1 matchup. That game at Nebraska was canceled. And I do think deep FBS, you need a sleeper, one-week wonder, or if you're looking for that DFS play, um, Cato Nelson is that guy this week. And so I don't know what's going to happen at, at running back uh, with, with Akron, but I'd be curious if, to see maybe somebody like Quadarius Smith, He connect, Cato Nelson connects with him. So if you've got some DFS action going on, those will be the guys that maybe you want to pay attention to that no one's had an eye on yet, but you need a name, uh, you know, uh, a, a deep sleeper. Texas Tech playing home against Lamar. You know, I have to tell you right now, Jet Duffy, right? If Jet Duffy was any good, wouldn't Jet Duffy be on the field? I mean, everything that we did in the preseason was handcuffed Jet, Jet Duffy with Alan Bowman, with, with McLean Carter. If Duffy was any good, he would have been on the field last week. It has to be Bowman this week, right? I mean, you would have to assume that Bowman is going to be the starter because it looks like that McLean Carter is going to be out with the ankle injury. But I have to feel, I would feel really good right now if you have DeLeon Ward. Great opener. They're going to be looking to lean on somebody other than the quarterback. They're not going to want to put everything on the shoulders of Bowman. And they've got a good matchup this week playing home against Lamar. And I think if you have DeLeon Ward, he's a guy to get in your roster this week. Speaking of running backs that had a good opening week, how about Scotty Phillips from Ole Miss? Right? If you have Scotty Phillips right now, you have to feel really good in that, especially with him playing in that Ole Miss offense. You've got A.J. Brown. You've got Demarcus Lodge. Um, you know, it, There's room for the running back. You've got Jordan Tamu, who's also a dual threat. Um, and there's not a lot of competition in that backfield. And I'm telling you, after that performance against Texas Tech, I'm not saying that he's going to do that every game. But it looks like you have a legitimate running back option that's going to start for Ole Miss this week. And they're playing Southern Illinois. I think you have to get him in your lineups this week and expect a good second week performance from a guy that probably wasn't on a week one roster that was one of the hotter waiver wire ads going into um, coming out of week one. East Tennessee State at Tennessee. 
Um, I like Marquez Callaway if you play in Power 5 leagues as a wide receiver. Is it going to be Tim Jordan? Is he just kind of a placeholder till Chandler gets back, who I think missed time with a concussion? I don't know. We'll see. But a, not a bad performance from Jordan in Week 1. And I think right now he warrants a roster spot if you need to build some running back depth right now in a matchup against East Tennessee State. I would even say you could take a chance on starting him this week if you need him at running back. And then North Dakota at Washington. Here's what I think. I don't know if the starter, somebody like Miles Gaskin, is going to play much in that game. I think Washington rolls to a big league. I th lead. I think you have to feel encouraged if you had Aaron Fuller. Or, or if you didn't have Aaron Fuller and you were able to get him off the waiver wire, he may be Jake Browning's number one target this year. I think you have to make a play for him if you need some receiver depth. But with Miles Gaskin, you know, do you start him against that type of a competition? And, and, and here's what I'll say. I don't expect Miles Gaskin to get more than 10 to 12, 10 to 15 carries in this game. But I don't know if there's been a running back in the past three years that has gotten you more for less, has given you more bang for your buck on fewer carries than somebody like Miles Gaskin. I would assume he has to be a shoe in for the end zone this week. Maybe he scores two, but maybe this is just the prototypical Miles Gaskin, 12 carries, 105 yards, two touchdowns. You take it, get him on the sideline, keep him healthy for next week, and you walk away with, you know, your 22, 24 fantasy points for the week and, and say thank you, Miles Gaskin. Iowa State playing at Iowa. Um, not a lot to see from Iowa State last week. Now, they'll go into a tougher matchup this week playing at Iowa. So you, you're going to have Montgomery hitting the road at Iowa, which is a tough matchup. I still think he's, he's almost too good not to start if you do not have the right matchups um, in, in, you know, throughout your, your running back uh, depth chart. And then Ivory Kelly Martin looks like he is the legit running back one. He did get the most carries for Iowa, so we'll see what shakeups that we'll see how that shakeouts sh shakeups over. Uh, uh, we'll see how that kind of develops over the next couple of weeks. It happens, guys. When you're running down this list, it happens. Um, but it looks like that Iowa offense. There's enough room for two tight ends. You've got Noah Font. You've got TJ Hawkinson. I wouldn't be afraid to pick up Hawkinson if you need a tight end and somebody already has Noah Font and you're struggling at tight end. Um, I think he can give you some points. I would expect Font to be the main guy, the red zone guy, the guy that's going to get all of the touchdowns. But Hawkinson, I think, could be a viable option uh, for you at, at tight end, in, especially in Power 5 leagues. West Virginia host in Youngstown State. And here's, you know, where's Kennedy McCoy? Where are the, uh, where you know, where are the West Virginia running backs? And here's what I think. Will Greer's run. It, this, this has to be a perfect storm for Will Greer to make a run to the Heisman. West Virginia looks solid. He's got David Sills returning. He's got Greg, uh, was it Greg Jennings returning. He's got uh, Gary Jennings, sorry. Uh, Gary Jennings returning. He's got T.J. Simmons, who we kind of gave a couple of weeks ago and who we had as the third best receiver for West Virginia, the Alabama transfer. You still got Marcus Sims out there, right? They are loaded at receiver. And they're, 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 these are receivers that Will Greer has, has great chemistry with. Matter of fact, Jennings matched his touchdown total from all of last season in week one. He only had one touchdown all of last year. He already got that in the first week. And... I think we have both of those guys projected in the top 15, and it looks like it is going to be a big year for Will Greer, Gary Jennings, and David Sills. UCF playing home against South Carolina State. I don't know if we're going to get much more from UCF's offense this week than we got last week playing at UConn. I think if you've got Mackenzie Milton, you've got to get him in there. He's probably going to throw four to six touchdowns in this matchup. I think you could expect them to be spread around between Nixon, Davis, Snelson, maybe mix one in there to Otis Anderson. Maybe Killens makes a 50, 60 yard run. I don't know if there's anybody other than Mackenzie Milton right now for this week, given this matchup that is going to have just a super fantasy week. He's the one guy that I would get in. And if I had a receiver from UCF, depending on the matchup, I'd likely have them in too. Because at this point, you know, if you're looking at a wide receiver three or you're looking at a flex, you're taking 100 yards and a touchdown with five receptions. You're taking that out of your flex guy at this particular point. So 
uh, the guys that I just don't know about are going to be maybe somebody like Killens, who I just don't think is going to get a ton of touches in this game. And like last year, you kind of have to hope he breaks a long touchdown run uh, for him to give you some decent fantasy points because let's be honest, he's just not a pounder uh, between the tackles. So we'll see. But th that's my call this week for the UCF offense. Savannah State, Savannah State playing at Miami. I think, you know, I think if you have Travis Homer, you get him in there. It looks like that Amon Richards is going to be out and miss the game with an injury. I think you could take a stab on somebody like Jeff Thomas hitting one or two over the top. Savannah State's bad, guys. I mean, look, UAB, I think it was UAB they played last week. Um, if you have the Miami defense this week, I mean, you've got to feel really good or disappointed if you don't get a shutout. But that's my take on, you know, I, I don't know really about uh, Malik Rozier moving forward. My, my, my thought was going into the preseason that Malik Rozier would struggle in the first matchup against LSU and that would open the door for Nikosi Perry. Maybe that happened. Maybe it didn't. The Savannah State game is a chance for Rozier to get back on track. But does it also open the door to give Perry some playing time? So I don't know if you have Malik Rozier, if you necessarily just roll him into this game. I, I, I like a chance on Jeff Thomas. Give me Travis Homer. And, and even DJ Dallas looks like he may not play in this matchup. And really, there's no reason for him to do so. So I think those are the two guys that I'm really targeting in this matchup, fantasy-wise, uh, going into Week 2 playing against Savannah State. Maryland at Bowling Green, I think it's an interesting matchup. I think if you have Scott Miller, you have to feel real good. Uh, I think he caught 10 passes out there in last week's matchup against Oregon. But when I look at Maryland, when I look at Maryland, um, the one player that, that I like right now, this week, um, is Tavon, ja Tavon Jacobs. Um, yeah, I think he got five carries out of the backfield. He was their leading receiver. And they played Texas. Not the greatest defense. But they're respectable. They're going to be way better than Bowling Green, who I think gave up 50-something points to Oregon last week. I think this could be a really good week to get Jacobs in your lineup for Maryland. I think he's a sneaky play on the road at Bowling Green. And if you have Bowling Green as well, I think you get Andrew Clare in that lineup. I mean, what he, he was still able to do some damage last week at Oregon, and I think you get him and Miller in your lineup if you have those two Bowling Green players and you get Jacobs in your lineup at the receiver, receiver spot or slot spot. Um, I just don't know what to expect from fantasy-wise from Kasim Hill and Ty Johnson right now. We still need to watch them for another week. Sorry, guys. feel like I'm talking a mile a minute. So, um, We've got Georgia Southern playing UMass. I think you have to like Andy Isabella in this matchup. I like Andy Isabella a lot. You know, you could tell by my preseason rankings that I really liked him. I, I think he'll have another good game. If you need a deep quarterback option, DFS, deep sleeper in your in full FBS, Shy Wirtz, the quarterback from Georgia Southern is uh, Southern is definitely worth a play. Appalachian State playing at Charlotte. I think if you have Benny LeMay. For Charlotte, you can take a chance on him. He looks like he is going to be a solid fantasy fantasy option at running back this year for Charlotte. And if you have Appalachian State, you've got to get Jalen Moore in there. Jalen Moore is just going to be an absolute stud, but I think you have to feel encouraged. Maybe, maybe quarterback Zach Thomas is going to be an option for Appalachian for, for a fantasy option moving forward. The quarterback at Appalachian State. I think you need to add him to your watch list right now moving forward as Appalachian State gets into these conference uh, matchups. Eastern Kentucky playing at Marshall for me. What's going to go on with Marshall quarterback? Is it going to be green? Is Thompson going to get the start? I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I can't get a lot of information out of that Marshall area. Um, but if you have Ty Tyree Brady, you get him in your lineup. I thought King would do better in week one. It was Keon Davis with the better week one out of the backfield. But if you have Tyree Brady, he's the receiver right now you want to get in your lineup going into this week two matchup. Clemson at Texas A&M. Texas A&M, you've got Travion Williams. Don't expect what he did last week going against that Clemson defense. You have Stern. I think it was uh, Jay Sternberger as a tight end option moving forward for 2018. I think Osbon, Osbon 
is going to be an option for you at receiver. I just don't know if you're going to get a lot this week. You may want to look if you have better options elsewhere. I would say of all those guys I just mentioned, Travion Williams would be your best fantasy option. And over at Clemson, over at Clemson, if you have Travis Etienne, I still, I love this guy this year. And I, I think his better better games are to come. Maybe this is it. I really like him, but I'm really curious to see, you know, much like the Miami quarterback situation, um, I really just think that Trevor Lawrence needs a crack in the door and the job's his. I, I, I think Tua Tagiavala in that national championship game really set the tone for quarterback for coaches to say, I can go with the true freshman. You see Nebraska doing it. I think Minnesota, what, I think they have the true freshman walk on. I, I, I think the trend is to go, and look, UCLA turned to the true freshman. Uh, really, the trend now, I think, because of that national championship game, we're going to see more true freshmen getting in sooner than later. And I just think that Clemson offense is going to be better with Lawrence. And I, I just wonder if last week, was the beginning of the end for Kelly Bryant. So we'll see. So I don't know what to recommend at the quarterback position for Clemson right now. I think you're a wait and see. And I think if you have T. Higgins, you're a wait and see because I feel that T. Higgins is better with Lawrence at quarterback. So you're kind of in a hold pattern right now. And this Texas A&M game for me will define who Clemson is on offense moving forward all season long. Southeastern Louisiana play in LSU. The best thing to come out of LSU last week is that we learned that Nick Brissett will be the running back one moving forward, and he's a start this week. UT Martin playing at Middle Tennessee this week. If you're looking at Middle Tennessee, not a lot to be encouraged about. I mentioned this in my exclusive email this week. The reason why I wasn't super high on Ty Lee at the beginning of the year is because I looked at the schedule, and I see a lot of inconsistencies in there based on the opponents that they play. I think two of the next Next four weeks, they play really good teams. Maybe there's a bye week mixed in there as well. So I don't know if you're going to get a lot of consistency out of Ty Lee, but if you are, this is the matchup that you're kind of licking your chops for, saying, this is why I drafted Ty Lee. This is where you need Ty Lee to perform this week. But I, you know, you've got Brad Anderson also doing some work out of the slot. You possibly have CJ Windham doing some work over there for Brent Stockstill, who only threw for one what, one touchdown and 176 yards against Vanderbilt last weekend. So you're going to see a vastly improved Middle Tennessee offense this week. And I'll tell you who my sleeper is. I think Tavares Thomas is a player to watch, the running back for Middle Tennessee. He was quiet last week playing against that Vanderbilt uh, um, defense. I think he's the guy. He's a sneaky play this week. If you have a chance to get him in a flex position, you can blame it on me if he doesn't perform, but I have a feeling Tavares Thompson, Thomas is going to perform this week for Middle Tennessee at home against UT Martin. Louisiana Tech hosting Southern. Uh, right now, you know, I have to tell you, I've gone back and forth on these two guys. Jaquise Dancy, Israel Tucker. I was all over Dancy in the preseason, drafted him in a lot of drafts. All of a sudden, we get the week one depth chart, and it's Tucker who's the starter. I went ahead in every league and just started making transactions and getting Tucker back on Tucker on my lineup, and it was Dancy who went for two touchdowns in the opening game. They both had similar touches. Uh, there wasn't a lot of difference, but Dancy had the better stats. I went back into the waiver wire and had to go back and get Dancy again. So, you know what? I, I'm rolling the dice. I, I'm, all, I'm not going to fill two roster spots with Louisiana Tech running backs. I'm going to go back to my preseason homework and research and say that it's going to be Dancy moving forward. Just like last year, there's going to be room for two running backs in that Louisiana Tech offense. I think Dancy's going to be the more productive one. What I'm really curious about is, is there any development from the Jamar Smith quarterback spot? Um, you know, Teddy Veal, where does he fit in? I think it was Adrian Smith maybe led the team in receiving. If I'm missing some of these game, got names, guys, uh, you know, I, I apologize, but I'm going strictly off of all of the memory that I have from week one's content. Um, but if I'm, you know, if I have Teddy Veal, I'm kind of wondering where's Jamar Smith's development? Am I going to be okay with Teddy Veal? Is he as high as I thought he was going to be in the preseason? So that that's still going to play out over the next couple of weeks. Southern Miss playing host to UL Monroe. 
from a, this this game is going to be a pure fantasy delight if you've got Kez Watkins off the off the waiver wire. You know, I said this about Eskridge. Um, he was probably, you looked at his numbers and you were like, man, I got to have this guy. I'm itching to get him in my lineup. But if you have Kez Watkins, I had Watkins over Eskridge on my preference list because of the matchups coming up down the line. Three touchdown catches, a punt return touchdown, week two matchup against UL Monroe, who almost went to, was a blocked field goal away from overtime against Southeastern Louisiana. And I have Evans and Marcus Green in one of my week one lineups. So I was hoping for an overtime game right there. But I think if you have Kez Watkins, you have to feel really good about that offense moving forward. I mean, his fantasy prospects moving forward, because I don't see an Edo Smith in that offense. Maybe Kez Watkins he looks like their playmaker this year. Ran a punt back. I think it was 81-yard punt return for a touchdown. So, if you have Kez Watkins, he is the player to have on Southern Miss this year, in my opinion. Coastal Carolina playing host to UAB. Um, I have something on Colin Lisa right here. You know, I, A.J. Erdely, I, I, you know, um, Spencer Brown. I, I called out Andre Wilson last week that those were the big three for UAB. Colin Lisa, I was high on at the beginning of the 2017 season, and it was Wilson that emerged as, his best, as their best receiver. Wilson, I believe, had double-digit catches last week, and I've gotten some emails, hey, you're not as high on Lisa. You know, why, why is that? And I have to tell you, UAB played Savannah State. I cannot put that much stock into a matchup against Savannah State. And just all of a sudden think that in week two, Colin, Leeson's, Colin Lisa is going to go out and give me another double-digit catch performance. I'm still, you know, Spencer Brown's got potential to plunge, plunge two or three in. The quarterback early has potential, like last year, to give you eight to ten rushing touchdowns. Um, I'm just not ready to pull the trigger on Colin Lisa yet. So remember I said that. I think you take him and add him and get him on your roster. I don't necessarily think if I've got the roster depth and the and the right matchups this week, if I'm putting him in my lineup and trust him enough just yet. We'll see. It's a matchup decision. Baylor playing at UTSA, and if you have Baylor right now, I think you look at those receivers. You know, I, I don't know what's going. I don't know if Brewer's going to be back at quarterback, but you've got Mims who caught a touchdown. You've got Jalen Hurd who caught a touchdown. Obviously, you have Chris Platt, so there's ways to spread the ball around. But obviously, Matt Rule's going to be establishing the run game. If you have Jamichael Hasty, if you have John Lovett, I'm curious to see how the how the carries shake out between those two. It's looking like a split right now. If I had to take one guy, I'm taking Hasty over Lovett right now. So I think when you look at Baylor this week, I think you take Hasty in, you put him in your lineup. I think if you have Mims, you put him in your lineup, and maybe the sneaky play is 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 Lovett and Hurd, depending on the depth on your roster. Indiana State playing Louisville, and I said this last week, if you had Louisville, all you wanted to do was come away from that game thinking, that I have something with Juwan Pass in 2018. I have something, and I'm telling you right now, you do. I absolutely love Pass. He's got weapons. He's got Fitzpatrick. He's got Jalen Smith. He's got Seth Dawkins. He's got Kamari Everett um, at the tight end spot. Jawan Pass, barring you know health, health you know barring injury, is going to have a huge year, 2018. Be thankful you got him on your on your rosters. Now's the time to get him in. It'll start paying dividends. Wyoming playing at Missouri. If you have Nico Evans, looks like he's going to miss the game with a rib injury. In my opinion, he's the only guy worth having on Wyoming's roster. The, the offense, the style that they play, you want to have him. Um, but unfortunately, he may not be there this week. If you have Missouri, I have to tell you, I was not really high on Drew Locke and Emmanuel Hall going into the 2018 season. But given the two matchups that Missouri has in these first two weeks, it's hard not to like those guys. I, I you know, I can't not rank them high just because I didn't think that they were going to have a good 2018 season. It's a long season, guys. I have to tell you, it's a long season. But given these early matchups, you've got to get Hall and you've got to get Drew Locke in there. But the situation that's playing out exactly like I expected is that Roundtree and Crockett are both splitting carries. And I don't know if that's going to change. 
I don't want to wish injury on anyone, but that may be the only way that one of those guys gets 20 to 25 carries a game is if the other gets nicked up. So let's see how that shakes up. And I'm really curious to see the tight end, Albert O, um, to see how he gets utilized in week two, because after a big 2017, you would expect him to have another solid 2018. But maybe it was the matchup in week one. Maybe he'll get utilized more as the matchups get tougher for Missouri and Drew Locke needs that safety blanket at the tight end. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, we're going to skip over Texas Southern at Texas Tech, Florida A&M at Troy. I think the only thing you're looking at there for Troy that's a play right now, given their running back rotation, is DeAndre Douglas at the wide receiver spot. You've got Samford playing at Florida State, Florida State coming off that loss to Virginia Tech. Um, I think this is going to be one of those games where maybe if you have Nyquan Murray, I don't know about DeAndre Fr Francois. I feel confident putting him in as my fantasy quarterback. But I think if you have Akers and I think if you have Murray, I think you could take a chance on him this week because here's what I feel. The Seminoles need to get the train on the track. They need a positive performance after that home loss to Virginia Tech on Labor Day. Somebody like Akers may get a little bit more work. Murray gets a few more looks than they normally would playing against a Sanford team. Maybe the starters stay in a little longer than usual considering that Florida State didn't win the first week and they lost. Had they won, you'd say, you know what, no reason to play these guys much. Um, let's just go ahead and give all the backups some, you know, get them out there the first quarter and you get a 21 nothing league. I don't, I don't know. I think Florida State needs to get the train on the track, and I think you, if you have acres, you get them in your lineup this week. Uh, Alabama State playing at Auburn, and I have to tell you, I have a lot of stock in Jartarvius Whitlow this year. I thought Cam Martin looked good. Um, I, would, I, you know, I kept waiting for Cam Martin to put the ball on the carpet just so Whitlow would get more carries. And then all of a sudden, Whitlow gets in there and gets the touchdown. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I think both of these guys right now, have, you know, it's a still holding pattern. And I mentioned last week it was probably going to take three or four games. That's what the coach said. That's what um, Malzahn said was going to take three to four weeks to play out before we really learn the running back pecking order. Right now, it does seem like it's one and Whitlow two, stranglehold one, two. But a lot can change. The one guy that I really love right now is Ryan Davis, the way that they're utilizing him. I see another big year for Ryan Davis. I think if you have Ryan Davis, you get him in your lineup this week. I love the matchup for him playing against Alabama State. I could see him taking one to the house, having a big, long catch. Um, I like Ryan Davis this week. Get him in your lineups. And then Kentucky playing at Florida. I think if you have Van Jefferson, uh, the, the Ole Miss transfer, you feel good going into this week. I don't know what's going to go on with the Florida backfield yet. I do still believe Malik Davis is going to emerge as the long-term option in that offense. And then over at Kentucky, obviously you've got dividends from Benny Snell. Um, and I think that's what it's going to be. The Kentucky offense is going to be the Benny Snell show this year again. Um, and you take advantage of why he's still around at Kentucky this year. Western Illinois playing at Illinois, the only person that I'm really can have an eye on if you have a DFS stake is maybe A.J. Bush, the quarterback for Illinois. Maybe you take you know some type of a punt on him. Virginia playing at Indiana. Obviously, Cole Jeffs went down with an ACL injury. Uh, you had Stevie Scott for Indiana carry the ball 20 times for 70 yards. It wasn't impressive, but he, they, he did get the ball 20 times. I like the guys that are going to give me high volume. Um, and, and so whether or not he was productive enough with those 20 carries, I think you kind of put him on your watch list. I don't know if you scoop him up unless you're in a deep power five league, but I'm curious to see how Virginia performs on the road. I have spent all season, preseason, saying how much I love Bryce Perkins and Alameda Zacchaeus for Virginia. Both of them paid dividends in week one at home. I believe they played Richmond. Um, I think they're both starts in week two. I love both of those guys. Um, I'm going to go down and follow my sword for them this year. Uh, I don't know why I'm putting that much stock in the Virginia offense. There's just something about these two guys. That's my trendy pick. Those, those are two of my differentials uh, players for 2018. Arkansas playing at Colorado State. It looks like it's going to be Ty Story uh, at, at, at the quarterback spot for Arkansas. You've got Colorado State. And here's what I feel. 
Izzy Matthews has not been as productive as he usually has been. Um, that Colorado State run game needs a jump start because their passing game is only going to be as good as their run game. They get Kings, Kinsley and Body back this week. Something, call it a gut feeling, call it a hunch. I don't know what it is. Something tells me you're going to see the emergence of Rashad Body this week as the Colorado State running back one moving forward into 2018. So if you have room on your roster and somebody dropped him because his first two games he wasn't there, instead of taking a chance on him, scooping him up on the waiver wire this week, if you have the room and he's available, put him on your roster going into week two. You don't have to play him this week. But if he has a breakout game, he will be a hot waiver wire addition. But he may not be if he's already on your roster. There's a philosophy right there that I like to take with a lot of guys that I have hunches on going into the week. If they're available, I'll put them on my roster. If they don't perform, it doesn't hurt me to drop them. It only hurts me if I felt something for them and I didn't pick them up and they hit the waiver wire and I lost them. So there's a little strategy that I like to play out over the course of the season. Utah playing at Northern Illinois. Um, I don't know if we're still going to see a lot from the Northern Illinois offense. I think for Utah, Tyler Huntley is going to be worth a play. Zach Moss is definitely, definitely a start. It was nice to see Marino was their leading receiver in week one. I don't know if he's a play this week in week two, considering that they're on the road to at Northern Illinois. But Matt Moss is definitely a play. Huntley is only an option given uh, your matchups for the week. Maine playing at Western Kentucky, and I think right here you're just looking at the Western Kentucky passing game. We got that. We got Eccles on our watch list. It, I, I, I would assume Lucky Jackson is going to be the top wideout. Uh, you've got Quinn Jernigan. Um, you know, I, I think Jacques Sloan has a chance to be a sleeper in that offense, but the West Kentucky offense is still probably two or three weeks before we really figure out who is going to emerge as their playmakers this year, but I think it's going to be Lucky Jackson. Florida International playing at Old Dominion. I have to tell you, Keyshawn Strong at running back got the start for Old Dominion. There were reports that Jeremy Cox wasn't going to play much or at all because of a bummed ankle. Uh, Cox did get in the game. I think he carried the ball maybe 12 times, 30-something yards. Don't hold me to the numbers, but it's pretty darn close. Um, I'll just tell you this. They got routed by Liberty, and I'm not saying Liberty is a bad team, but by no stretch of the imagination, I think Liberty should be beating Old Dominion 50 something to 12 to 10 or 14 or whatever the score was. Um, I have concerns if you have Jeremy Cox over the next two to four weeks because if he does have a slight ankle sprain or something wrong with his ankle, it may take him three to four weeks to break out of that funk and you may not get much from him. So it may be somebody that you may have to hold depending on how this week up, week's matchup goes you might have to drop him. So let, let, let's let monitor Jeremy Cox this weekend. Incarnate Word playing at North Texas. I think from this matchup, obviously Mason Fine is a must start. You've got Jalen Guyton, who is a must start. And after watching last week's matchup, I think you get Nick Smith in your lineup this week. I, think, I have not covered USC Stanford yet. Um, I, I think you get... Nick Smith in your lineup this week and you roll the dice if you need him. I, I think he can get back on track this week. I think he will be there running back one against Incarnate Word. This would be a good um, confidence builder game for, for him. And I think you can roll the dice with Nick Smith this week. Fresno State playing at Minnesota. I think you look at this and just say, Rodney Smith, can you get it in the end zone for me? I think he's going to get the carries. Will he get to the end zone this year on a regular basis? Penn State playing at Pitt. Trace McSorley's your guy. Trace McSorley's should be in your lineup. I don't care if they're playing on the road or if they're playing on home. Trace McSorley is just magic. And if you didn't believe that on, on that on that come from behind game tying drive last week, uh, Trace McSorley's just a winner, guys. And, and you know what? He's a great fantasy option for your quarterback as well. Over at Pitt, high expectations for Darren Hall going into the season. Uh, Kadri Allison got, I believe, led the team in carries. We heard that it was going to be a 50-50 split leading into the season, just you know, a couple weeks leading, and it, that's the way that it played out. So we'll have to monitor that pit running back situation uh, over the next couple of weeks. But right now, for me, it doesn't look like it's worth having any of those guys on my roster right now. 
New Mexico State playing at Utah State. What a disappointment Jason Huntley and that New Mexico State offense has been. I mean, I think Huntley has caught eight passes, but he has done nothing on the ground. I do think a sneaky play this week, deep FBS, is Darwin Thompson running back Utah State. Remember I said that name, put him on your watch list. Two touchdowns last week at Michigan State, and he'll have bigger holes to run in this week against New Mexico State. Could be a name that a lot of you guys see on the waiver wire next week. South Alabama playing at Oklahoma State. I think Justice Hill is a much must start here. I think you get Cornelius in there. I think for me, what I'm watching is what's going on with the wide receiver spot at Oklahoma State. You know, Jalen McCluskey is, you know, he's kind of the, the senior leader of that group. He had the best week one. A lot of, lot of praise for Tyron Johnson and Dylan Stoner going into the season. Not much to talk about in week one at all for either one of those guys. But, let, you know, it's a long season. Let's see how it plays out. And we just have to monitor that Oklahoma State wide receiver position. Tulsa playing at Texas. It was nice to see Shamari Brooks and Corey Taylor. Uh, there's enough carries for two in that offense. With obviously Brooks being the, the golden guy, I would say, in that offense over at Texas. I don't know. Um, it, it, Trey Watson seems like he's the best back to have right now. I don't know if that'll play out right now. If I'm looking at Texas players... I'm going for Colin Johnson right now. I don't even know if Sam Ellinger's the, the long-term option at quarterback for Texas, but I am looking at Colin Johnson uh, at, the wide out, uh, at the wide receiver position for my fantasy team. Nickel State playing at Tulane, and I have to tell you, I was high on Darius Bradwell in the preseason. Um, here's, a, here's a name for you, Stephen Hudson. Uh, Bradwell may not play this week, and if he doesn't play this week, Hutterson could be a nice sleeper name to add to your watch list. And obviously, um, Taron Enclay, the receiver from Tulane, the big play guy, the more effective that run game is, the better he will be at down shot, uh, downfield shots. And, you know, that's a guy, given in the offense that he plays and the types of passes that Tulane throws— he could be one of your top receivers at the end of the year that who has the highest yards per catch average given X amount of catches throughout the year. So um, Taron Enclade is not a bad addition to your roster as a wide receiver three or even a flex option. Southern Utah playing at Utah State. We're getting to the last dozen games of this week's slate. Boy, I mean, Bradford at wide receiver, Artavis Pierce at running back. I think you've got to feel good about Pierce at running back. I mean, Man, did I sleep on him in the preseason. If he is going to do against other teams what he did against Ohio State, man, I I missed on him. Um, but don't miss on him right now if he's on your waiver wire. If Arcavis Pierce is out there, I think right now um, he's he's as, almost as good as a running back you're going to have maybe at a tier two level, uh, just about anybody compared to anybody given the right matchup. So Artav Artavis Pierce, get him in your lineups in week two. Cincinnati playing at Miami of Ohio. I'm looking for something from James Gardner this week. Uh, he was higher in our rankings. I'm looking for him to give us something this week. Here's something I never did last week. I'll do it this week. Um, as far as, you know, for you guys that play out there, that that bet, right? I mean, I, in my opinion, the lock of the week is going to be, give me Cincinnati. Um, I think they might be giving up a point or a point and a half on the road at Miami of Ohio. I mean, here's a team that travels across the country, wins at UCLA. They come back home, play essentially what is a, a home game on the road. They may have more fans there than Miami of Ohio. And they, you know, they're an, I think they're an underdog. Uh, give, me, give me the Bearcats, lock it up, put it down, go make yourself some money. But anyway... Desmond Ritter, the quarterback, should be added to your watch list. I don't know how much he's going to give us, but um, is it Michael Warren, the running back, um, what, 30 carries last week against UCLA? I mean, there's no doubt about it. That guy should be on a roster, off the waiver wire. Um, he should be probably in your lineup starting this week. You give me a guy, and I say this all the time, it's my philosophy, you give me a guy like A.J. Dillon that I know is going to get 25 to 30 carries per game, and I'm putting him in my lineup every week. I mean, how many times? I mean, you, you give me somebody that's going to get 25 to 30 carries, he's going to find the end zone at least once, and he's probably going to give you at least 100 yards. Book it. 100 yards, touchdown. If that's what happens this week, expect that from Warren um, this weekend uh, playing at Miami of Ohio. Um. You've got uh, USC playing at Stanford. So, uh, somebody's out there said they joined late. Had I gotten to USC Stanford, I had not yet. 
what a dud by Bryce Love in week one, right? Uh, what a dud. Um, if you have Art Sega Whiteside, you know, and here's a quick somebody emailed me, they had Art Sega Whiteside in their lineup and they had, were really stacked at receiver. And I, here's one of those things, kind of like Dwayne Eskridge over at, at Western Michigan. Sometimes you really got to, pa- you know, you have to really restrain yourself from having a knee jerk reaction by dropping somebody that has a poor performance in week one. You also have to make sure you give it some thought before you just throw in a guy for week two because he's coming off of a big game. That's what I kind of feel with our Sega White side this week. Now, I actually think that he is going to be better than what most people thought leading up to the season. I don't think I had him too low. I don't think we had him too low in the rankings at all. I think we had him at a really good spot. But given that week one performance... I'm not ready to just throw him into the starter's role when I'm stacked at wide receiver. I happen to think that this is a Bryce Love game. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I would be expecting more on a week-to-week basis from Marsega Whiteside than 100 yards and a touchdown as the ceiling. I think last week was the exception to the rule. If you're looking at USC, you've got JT Daniels, the freshman quarterback, making his first road start of his collegiate career. You've got Amon Ross St. Brown, who look, has this tremendous chemistry with him. Obviously, they go back to high school. Um, Ty LaVon's a little bit of a sleeper after week one. I look for him to reemerge here in, in week two. Um, but what about the running back situation at USC, right? Stephen Carr was so high on our lists. And then he had the back surgery. All the reports coming out was that he was fine. Missed a little bit of time in preseason camp. Next thing you know, three guys are rotating in the lineup, and he was the only one of the three backs that I think received at least eight carries to not score a touchdown. If you've got Stephen Carr right now, maybe you're holding, maybe you're dumping, maybe you're trading, um, but he's definitely not in your lineup in week two. I really think this is a bounce-back week for Bryce Love. I think this is a week, unless you play in a Power 5 league only, you can get our Sega Whiteside in your lineup. If you play in full FBS, I'm still looking at other matchups that could be better besides him. If you're playing Power 5, Amon Ross St. Brown is probably in your lineup. Tyler Vaughns is probably in your lineup. In full FBS, I'm just not sure I'm ready to take a gamble on USC this weekend on the road at Stanford. So that's my take on the USC-Stanford game. Sorry to be so long-winded, but I want to touch on a number of players there. UTEP, UNLV. I won't be long at all. Amari Rogers is go- Amani Rogers is going to be a sleeper quarterback. I think he'll be okay. But after watching Lexington Thomas and what he did at USC this week, Lexington Thomas is, I think we have him in the top five this week. He's going to explode this week playing at home against UTEP. Sacramento State playing at San Diego State. Jawan Washington is going to be a stud. If he stays healthy, he will get 2,000 yards. He will be the third consecutive 2,000 yard back at San Diego State barring injury. But if you play in a deep, uh, power, uh, full FBS league this this week, don't be afraid to pick up uh, Chase Jasmine and maybe stick him in there as a flex option. Because I think at some point in time, San Diego State's going to have this game well out of hand and Chase Jasmine's going to give you some, some yards, maybe 100 yards and a touchdown in a mop-up role. UConn playing on the road at Boise State. What a surprise David Pendell was last week, passing and running. I don't know if he does that this week at Boise State. Boise State, look, they had a hiccup last year, I think, against Virginia where they gave up a ton of points. I think they gave up maybe 19 to Air Force last year at home. Other than that, when you take it, I think they had 10 or 8 game, eight home games last year. Six of those games, I don't think they gave up more than 14 points. I think you can expect similar uh, outcomes again this year. Uh, I don't necessarily think Pindell is a start at Boise State this week. But if you look at Boise State, you've got Alexander Madison at running back. And with Octavius Evans being out, who I like going into the preseason, Sean Monster came away from week one as their top target. I have to tell you right now, if I'm reevaluating the wide receiver position at Boise State, I'd much rather have Modster right now with what I have, what I know is a, a known commodity versus Octavius Evans, which the talent's there, but I don't know what I'm going to get yet. In my opinion, Modster may be the number one guy this, this year. We won't know until Evans gets back, but if I have, um, I believe it's A.J. Richardson, 
Um, I don't know if I'm really holding on to him at this point because I'm looking at it thinking it's Modster or maybe it's Evans coming out once when, once when he gets back. And I'm looking at those two guys, but right now, if I had to to put anything down on it, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Monster just because he he proved himself right out of the gate in Week One. California playing on the road at BYU, and I think we're watching two players in this game, maybe three if you want to throw in the tight end Matt Bushman at BYU. But it's going to be Patrick Land versus Squally Canada. Canada coming in on a bunch of emails for me. Um, I I think he's a start in this game. I don't think he's a slam dunk start. Um, but I do think he's a start in this game, given your roster, given your weekly matchups. But especially in PPR leagues, everything goes through Patrick Laird on that Cal offense. They're going to need him this game. So Laird, Canada, other two names we're looking at this week. Michigan State playing at Arizona State. And I have to tell you, you know, all the questions going on with Herm Edwards uh, coaching over at Arizona State. A lot of concerns about Nikhil Harry being a top 10, top 5 receiver in our rankings. Boy, he came out of the gate really strong. So did Eno Benjamin. Um, no concerns right now on that projections with Nikhil Harry. He looks like he will be an elite receiver for 2018. I think for the Michigan State side, I think for me, uh, Lou Werke needs development, right? I think he's going to be okay over the long term. I'm really curious to see if Connor Hayward is going to cut into LJ Scott's carries over the long term. I think Scott had 20 carries this past week. I still think if you have LJ Scott and no better options, you get him in your lineup this week. But you know, much like a situation with Navy and Malcolm Perry, Zach Abey, uh, maybe like a Shamari Brooks, Corey Taylor, where there's two backs somewhere. Maybe you worry about, especially if you have LJ Scott, Lewerke can run it in himself. And if you add Connor Haywood as another factor into being a touchdown vulture, you wonder how high LJ Scott's fantasy ceiling can be for 2018. We'll have to monitor that in the coming weeks. Uh, We have San Jose State playing at Washington State after that performance. Gardner Minshew is nailed down as the starter. No concerns going forward. James Williams with another huge start, much like he did last year. Remember, he did fizzle out a little bit as the season wore on. But if this year is going to uh, be any, if last year was going to be any indicator to this year, James Williams is a start this week as well. You can probably expect this from him for three or four games until defenses adjust, it seems like, like they did last year. But from a receiver spot, you've got Martin. Um, you've got Desmond Patman, I think, who had a big game. And maybe Jameer Calvin. I, I think those were the three guys in, in week one. I'm still not ruling out Kyle Sweet as a uh, surprise option in that offense as well. And Max Borgi, the, uh, the, the freshman running back, actually can pay dividends in a Power 5 league right now. Maybe in a full FBS, deep league at a flex position. Keep an eye on him. Add him to your watch list as well. And then the last game, Rice at Hawaii. Rice at Hawaii the last night. Hawaii giving us reasons once again, as they did many years ago, to stay up till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning and, and watch that box score with Cole McDonald, with Cedric Bird, with John Arsua at the wide receiver spot. And I have to tell you, Rice actually surprised me. After almost losing to Prairie View A&M in week one, uh, they really gave Houston a game for about three quarters last week. And I think if you have Emmanuel Subka or if you have um, Austin Austin Walters, I believe it is, out of the backfield, he's getting carries and catches. Um, that they their options moving into conference play um, as we get two or three weeks into the season. So there it is, guys. I mean, this this show's already going on longer than it did last week. But you know, while I have you on, um, you guys love college fantasy football. I promised you at the beginning of the show I would roll out the start bench. So I'm going to do it. Even though the show's going longer, I'm going to keep you on for everybody that wants to stay on for a few minutes longer. I'm going to roll out what we will post up on the site. A little bit later tonight for tomorrow morning. And I'm going to go ahead and just give you my start bench going into week two. And I'm going to start off with the bench players. And number one on my list, Justin Hansen, quarterback, Arkansas State. You know, he opened the season last week throwing six touchdowns against Southeast Missouri State. But there's no mistake in who their opponent is this week, right? Arkansas State playing on the road in Tuscaloosa. Now, I do think that Hansen can engineer some scoring drives for the Red Wolves, but I don't think he's worth the risk. You put him on your bench in week one. David Pindell, the quarterback, UConn, threw for 266 yards last week, ran for 157 against Central Florida. They lost (coughs) 56-17. But as I mentioned when I was touching on Boise State earlier, 
they they they're playing possibly <coughs> excuse me the top two group of five teams in college football this year. So they're not playing any slouches. And like I said last year, uh, a few minutes ago, Boise State held six of their eight opponents to 14 of points or less last year. And I think that's a trend that continues into 2018. And I think David Pindell, UConn quarterback, if you were able to get him in the draft or if you were able to scoop him up on the waiver wire, is a week two bench. I'll stick with another quarterback this week. Ty Ganji, quarterback, Nevada. I mentioned this earlier in the show. You know, last week he threw for 342 yards, three touchdowns. They won 72-19 over Portland State. This week the competition gets much tougher. Nevada travels to Vanderbilt, a team, a defense that held Middle Tennessee's Brent Stockstill to 178 yards passing uh, last week in the season opener. I think you pass on Ty Ganji this week. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're going to take a flyer on any of the Nevada players this week, it's McLean Mannix, wide receiver, Nevada. Here's another. I talked on about Jason Huntley earlier. I don't even know if Jason Huntley is on rosters at this particular point, but the running back from New Mexico State, who we all had hoped that would be Larry Rose's successor, now he is. But here's the deal. You know, they lost the quarterback. They lost a wide receiver. They lost so much on offense, guys, that there's not a lot around Jason Huntley. So he's only got 28 rushing yards on 13 carries. He's averaging 2.2 yards per carry. He's got eight receptions this year for 36 yards, but his output has to be a major concern for fantasy rosters, even if he's on a, ro even if he's on a roster at this point. So in no way should Huntley be a starter in week two on the road at Utah State. Izzy Matthews. Running back Colorado State, they're playing home against Arkansas. I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, here's the deal. Matthews, the running game, he's yet to get going in 2018. In two games, he's got 93 yards on 30 carries. He's averaging only 3.1 yards per attempt. Marvin Kinsley, Rashad Body returned from suspension this week, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a reduced in amount of touches for Izzy Matthews this week in Week 2. Now, Stephen Carr, and I mentioned this as well. I don't know if I've got Stephen Carr in my lineup right now, and I bet you he's some roster, whether or not he's even questioned, you're questioning whether or not to even have him on your roster. You know, in week one matchup against UNLV, he split carries with Ware. He split carries with Malapé. In fact, he, and I said this already, he was one of the, he was the one of the, um, he was the only one of those three that did not score a touchdown. And at this particular point, fantasy owners need to keep him on your bench. We're in a wait and see with Stephen Carr running back USC. And last but not least on the bench spot, Dwayne Eskridge, Western Michigan at Michigan. You know, his fantasy owners are certainly going to itch to get him in their lineup. I mentioned that earlier after his breakout performance, caught eight passes, 240 yards, two touchdowns against Syracuse last week. But I don't necessarily feel there's going to be an encore performance, guys. They play on the road at Michigan this week, and I think Dwayne Eskridge is a Week 2 bench. Um, Western Michigan's Dwayne Eskridge, Week 2 bench at Michigan. So here we go for the starts. And, and you know, I think you probably can, you guys have probably clued into some of these guys because of the, the way that I talked to them, uh, talked about them on the show already. But I'll start off with Jafar Armstrong. He didn't exactly roll up the rushing yards last week against Michigan. But he carried the ball 15 times. He found the end zone twice. If he gets 15 carries this week against Ball State, he could give fantasy owners 100 yards rushing this week. I think Jafar Armstrong, the utilization he's going to get, he's worth a start this week playing at home against Ball State. Artavis Pierce running back Oregon State, you know, in last week's loss to Ohio State, he totaled over 200 yards of offense, scored two rushing touchdowns, and... I expect the offense to go through Artavis Pierce in Week 2. Home matchup against FCS opponent Southern Utah. Get Artavis Pierce in your lineups in Week 2. Chris Warren, running back. Cincinnati playing at Miami of Ohio. Here's the deal. They, yeah, and I mentioned this earlier. They traveled to UCLA last week. They don't have to leave their state for a Week 2 road game. So it's essentially like a de facto home game for them. And he carried the ball 35 times. 142 yards last week, three touchdowns. He even led the team in receiving with three receptions for 39 yards. Okay, so he was the entire offense. I expect him to continue his hot spark, uh, hot start, and you ride a guy like that into week two. He's the guy that I'm riding 
week two. Get Chris Warren in your lineups for Cincinnati playing on the road at Miami of Ohio. Three receivers to close it out. Tavon Jacobs, wide receiver Maryland, playing at Bowling Green. I mentioned him only uh, earlier in the show. And not only was he the team's leading receiver against Texas, but he had six rushing attempts for 23 yards. Expect the field to open up more for Maryland offense this week now that they're not playing Texas. They're traveling to Bowling Green and face a Bowling Green defense that gave up 51 points to Oregon last week. Get Tavon Jacobs, wide receiver Maryland, in your starting lineup. Anthony Ratliff Williams, wide receiver North Carolina, playing at East Carolina. I mentioned this earlier too. Nathan Elliott, accuracy issues last week at Cal. He only completed 15 of 35 passes. He threw four interceptions, but Ratliff Williams was still able to give you 62 yards and a touchdown catch. Expect it to get a little easier for Nathan Nathan Elliott this week, playing at East Carolina a team that lost to NCA&T last week in their season opener. Anthony Ratliff-Williams is a week two start. Wide receiver, North Carolina, and the last guy. Watkins, Kez Watkins, wide receiver, punt returner, Southern Miss, playing at home against UL Monroe. He is probably going to give you four quarters in this matchup. And quite simply, he was a playmaker for the Golden Eagles in their 55-7 win over Jackson State. It was only Jackson State. Yes, I get that. He caught eight passes, though, for 138 yards. He added an 81-yard punt return, touch, punt return touchdown to his weekly totals. And this week, Southern Miss hosts UL Monroe, a team that gave up 31 points to Southeast Louisiana. So I would expect... Another huge game from Kez Watkins, Southern Miss wide receiver. And there is your week two start bench, guys. This might be the longest show I've ever done. I expect them to get shorter as questions become answered. Thanks for staying in with me the whole time. I know there's an NFL game on. Um, I'm going to let you guys go. And until next week, guys, it's been fun. Really enjoy it. I will talk to you guys later. And I'll see if I can maybe catch a question on here real quick that I that I missed. Um at the end of the show, can you rank these guys? Rondell Moore, Chenault, Miller, Kustis, and Brooks, and Benjamin. I don't I don't know if you want me to rank them for this week, or if, if you want me to rank them for this week, you've got to check out the rankings up on the site. If you want me to rank them long term, um, I, I, I would have to put Brooks at the top of my list, and I would probably go Miller 2, Benjamin 3, Rondell Moore. I don't know. Rondell Moore, LaVisca Chenault. I don't know whether I go there because... There's a little more competition at Colorado, but the way that the early seasons played out, maybe Chanel. Uh, do you feel like Barrett better going forward than Perkin, Perkins at UVA? Um, I love Perkins. I'm going to keep saying I love Perkins. Sorry I joined in late. I covered USC Stanford. What do you think of Hawaii's Ursua, Bird, JoJo? I don't know about JoJo yet, um, I, but Ursua and Bird are definitely top 15 wide receivers. I think when you look at teams and receivers, Hawaii – and West Virginia are two that really jump out for me where I think you're going to see two of their guys in the top 20 every single week. So that's it, guys. I'll see you all next week. Have a good, have a good weekend and good luck to everyone.